Tonight, Abraham's descendants and Abraham's children sounds like the same thing. It's the difference in Abraham's descendants and in Abraham's children. And if you think they are the same thing, it's okay. They're not. But don't be dismayed. Jesus is the first person to bring out that they are not. And Israel, 1,500 years, a couple thousand years of their history prior to Jesus, would have argued that there's no difference in a descendant and a child. Jesus will articulate that there is, and Paul will basically write a doctoral thesis on the subject in, in his work. And so I want to actually take you, we're going to work in the middle of the eighth chapter of John tonight. That's where we are in our chronological journey. But for the maybe three times in 53 lessons, we've opened with a verse not in John. Tonight's one of those times. I don't want to open in John. I want to open where I want to end tonight. So I'm going to start there and end there, and we're going to fill in the, the stuff in between with this journey that Jesus goes on in John 8. So let's start with Paul in Galatians 3. I want to read the last four verses of the third chapter of Galatians and lay this out as our starting block for our thought tonight. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's a a bigger verse than, than, than maybe we give it credit for. It's not saying you are the Son of God, Jesus, but it is saying you're all sons of God. And that's a pretty path-breaking statement in the first century. They, had, they were just now coming to grips in Paul's day that Jesus was the Son of God. And Paul says, you're all sons of God. That had to be a tough one to swallow. It's tough to this day. I could literally say that. If you didn't put the scripture on the screen and you walk into the average church and say, you are all sons of God, it doesn't go down smooth in every place because it's debatable. Well, you know, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying what Paul said. You are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's an interesting Statement for Paul, a little unlike a lot of his other statements, Paul doesn't just preach a Jesus you've put on, Paul preaches a Jesus you've put in. But he's making a greater point here. As many of you as were baptized have put him on, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Here's what you are. Here's what you think you are, Jew or Gentile. But you've went into Christ, so you've put something else on. So Jews, circumcision, Gentiles, uncircumcision, Jews, Moses, Gentiles, whatever. That's, that's your identity, but you've been baptized into Christ. And through faith in Christ, you've put on a new identity. So it's like a new coat. It's not just your nationality. There's not a Jew, no Gentile. There's not slave. There's not free. There's not male. There's not female. This is the identifying things of the world. So whether it's religion, class, gender, put something else on. You're all one in Jesus. And if you are Christ, this is the key verse. This is the reason I'm here, because I always context you into 29. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and your heirs according to the promise. Three important things in Galatians 3.29 that lay the foundation for tonight's lesson. Helps us in John 8. Number one, if you belong to Christ. Plain and simple, if you belong to Christ, 26, you're one of the sons of God. So you come into this through a family relationship in Christ. If you belong to Christ, number two, you're Abraham's seed. You're not a Jew. You're not a Gentile. You're not a slave. You're not free. You're not male. You're not female. How can you call yourself Abraham's seed if you're not also a Jew? You can, you can already see that Paul's doing something odd. Paul stripped away your religious identity by heritage, Jew, Gentile. Jewish is a heritage identity. It's not just a religious identity. Because you'll have people even to this day say, I'm Jewish, that don't practice Judaism. Okay? What they've done is they've placed an identity. It's like saying, I'm male, I'm female, I'm slave, I'm free. So if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed, regardless of Jew or Gentile. We're in, real, we're in really thin ice right here <laughs> with his Jewish friends. And then three, your heirs according to promise. So you heirs means you get something by inheritance. Why, why do you get an inheritance? Because 26, you're one of the sons of God. 
Sons get inheritance. But you're an heir according to what? Not works, not, not bloodline, not gender, not heritage, promise. So if you belong to Christ, you also can call yourself one of Abraham's seed and you get what was promised to Abraham, not because you're Jewish, but because you have a promise. Now that's easy. That slides down easy for believers. We're, we're cool with that. It's the good new covenant stuff. Got to come in through Jesus. You get all the good stuff God promised Abraham. You get it. You don't have to earn it. You get it all by inheritance. But you're thinking like a 21st century Christian in the Western world. And I want you to stop that because John 8 is not written to 21st century Christians in the Western world. Neither is Galatians 3. I want you to think more like someone standing in Jesus' world. Watching the carpenter from Nazareth navigate these landmines of theology that are being tossed out in front of him all the time. And Jesus has a fascinating encounter that encompasses the middle of John 8. Here's our verse for the night to start us in our text. We stopped at 32 last week. You'll know what 32 was when you see their question. 33, they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So based upon John 8, 33, do you remember John 8, 32? And it was, of course, You'll know the truth. This was our title lesson last week. You know the truth. Truth will make you free. Their rebuttal to you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free is free from what? We've never been, we're not in bondage. In fact, we're Abraham's descendants. How can you tell us you will be made free? So when confronted with the reality of truth being that which sets a man free, the response that the leaders of Israel give is not to embrace it, not even to ask what truth looks like or sounds like, which would seem to be the logical answer. Instead, they go into a sort of a turtle mode. They get defensive. They, they sort of lock up because how dare you say that we need to be free? And they go back to this defense mechanism that they've had for a while. And that made me think about how big was this moment? So I start, I've been wrestling with how big was this for Jesus? Is this an inconsequential moment in between two amazing miracles? Well, not miracles, but two amazing stories. John 8, woman caught in the act of adultery. John 9, man born blind. In between, I am, and they want to stone me for it, but a bunch of conversation, and is it just filler? Are we just kind of bridging from one spot to the other? Or is Jesus in some deep water here? And I'm, the, the more I wrestle with it, the more I'm coming out going, Jesus is in deep water, and it's hot water, and it's a problem. But why is it a problem? Because he's been in some big moments before with the Pharisees. What makes this one so much different? And so this is where the wrestling took me. To this point, and I'm talking to John 8, 33. To this point, Jesus has confronted Israel only in her relationship to Moses. Here's an example you'll recall from John 5, when we were way back, I don't know when that was, some months ago. John 5, 45, when Jesus says to them, don't think that I've come to accuse you. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Remember that? So to this point, he's only really dealt with how they feel about Moses. But now he confronts Israel's relationship to Abraham. This is a bridge too far. Why? Because Israel's relationship to Moses speaks of righteousness. And Israel is accustomed to having her righteousness questioned. She's had her righteousness questioned from day one. She's dealt with prophets and, and, and the word, and she's repented, and she's offered sacrifices, and she's been expelled from the land, and then she got the land back, and then she wins a battle, and then she gets beat half to death. She's used to God going, you're not righteous, you're going to pay. It goes, okay, we're going to pay, and, and we're going to lose. Coming along and going, you guys aren't as righteous as you think you are. Okay, we've probably never been as righteous as we think we are. It's pretty simple. But to question her relationship to Abraham, now you're messing with her identity, and there's no room in Israel for that kind of questioning. In other words, you can deal with Moses with us. And up until John 8, 33, right in that area, Jesus has dealt with Israel as a product of Mosaic Judaism. John's even done it. The law was given by Moses. 
Grace and truth came by Jesus. You don't think I've come to accuse you. You have one that accuses you, even Moses. Um, he without sin among you casts the first stone. That's, that's Moses. Moses gives you the right to cast stones. Jesus is, okay, go for it. <laughs> if, you're, if you think you've done enough, then fire away. So all he's ever done is deal with them through that lens. And then he changes tactics. And this is why he's in deep water and hot water. Because now he goes, now the conversation is going to turn towards Abraham. And their Abraham identity is something they think is at a visceral level. It's at a blood level. They don't know this word, but if they did, they'd have used it. It's, at, it's in their DNA. That's how closely connected we are to Abraham. We think circumcision is just a surgical procedure. For them, circumcision was the procedure. It was the procedure of your life. It was the procedure that connected you. And again, they wouldn't have known the phrase DNA, but had they known it, they would have said, circumcision is what shows that I have the same DNA as Abraham because I've been circumcised. And so that connected the generations all the way back. Not only could you trace your father to, to, to Abraham, you were part of something bigger than yourself. So even if you were unrighteous, even if you were acting stupid, even if you got kicked out of the land and you didn't take care of the widows and the strangers and the fatherless and the, and, and the homeless and you, and you served other gods and you sacrificed to Baal and God kicked you out of the land and then God gave it back, okay, well and good. But we're still his people. Our, our circumcision still connects us to Abraham. No matter what, we're going to get what he promised Abraham. And they were right. That, and they knew it. And it had always, no matter how bad it got because of how stupid they had acted, that's their Moses relationship, they still had their Abraham relationship. It's kind of like this. No matter how bad things got at work, they still knew where they lived. They still had a house to go home to. No matter how bad things got on the surface, they still had the Abrahamic covenant as a connection. And so there's no room for Jesus to deal with them in Abraham. They're not going to put up with it. John the Baptist tried. And so I want to take you back to that moment. And I want to look at something that we didn't get to look at closely because John, we're in John. And John doesn't deal with John the Baptist in the same way that some of the other gospels do. And if you remember, I got so hungry to deal with John the Baptist in the early stages of our study that we did end up doing some John the Baptist stuff. But I want to do it again because I want to show you how John confronted this Abrahamic idea. Here's Matthew 3. We begin in verse 4. I'm, I'm not going to work every word. We're not trying to study Matthew. I'm just, I want to use this story to sort of set us up for something else. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around the waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region about the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. This is an, an, an interesting sort of new rite. Israel doesn't traditionally go confess their sins and get baptized in water without killing lambs, but they do wash their hands at sacrifice. And so John takes that hand washing to the next level and he begins to immerse people into the reality of, of something. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. So look at what he calls the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they show up. This is, un, I mean, there's, there's no precedent for him to do this, but he picks vipers, snakes. Think of the Hebrew imagery of snake and where it first surfaces. So where, John, where does John pull this idea? You brood of vipers, why are you guys here? That's what who warned you to flee from the wrath to come means, by the way. So what are you guys doing here? Who told you to get out here because something bad's coming down the pipe? So it's, it's kind of an interesting way of turning the sermon on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father, because I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, Every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I want you to think about a couple of things John does here. Well, first of all, he says God's able to raise up children of these stones, children unto Abraham. He's standing by the Jordan. 
there's a good chance that the stones he's pointing at is the mountain of stones that Joshua pulled out of the river when Israel crossed into the promised land. Remember, they took 12 stones out of the wilderness, put them in the dry riverbed of the Jordan, took 12 stones out of the Jordan, put them on the dry side of the promised land, and then the waters flooded over the old stones. We've all heard sermons on you're putting what's in your wilderness into the floodwaters, and then you're taking out of the floodwaters what's a part of him as a monument. All good sermons, but what's it have to do with the New Testament? John points at it and says, you've been bragging about this little stone statue ever since you got into the promised land, but God's, God's been able to raise up new kids from these stones. Don't consider yourself special just because of the rock. And then an interesting connection, the ax is laid to the root of the trees, the tree's got to come down. So, snakes, a tree that's got to come down. Think like a Jew. Think Torah. Snakes, tree. Serpent, tree. Garden. Snakes and trees, a garden, and a tree that needs to fall. And John is saying, I'm here to tell you, I'm the first axe blow against the tree, you bunch of snakes. John's not very popular with the way he <laughs> preaches to the religious establishment of his day. He basically lays out a pretty rough... Um, well, a pretty rough image, and it identifies this way. The leadership are vipers, and he's working from a tree. <laughs> the vipers are working from a tree that needs to be cut down. And I think these are garden images. I almost capitalized G there. Just think, make you think garden of it, Eden, rather than just any old garden. But they're garden images with the leadership of Israel cast as the snake working from a tree. John presents his ministry as the first axe blow to that system. I wish I'd thrown this sentence in. Think of this. These are garden images with leadership cast as the snake working from a tree. If I had to elaborate on that, I would say that John is pitching the system as the tree and the leadership as the snake deceiving people into that system. And what has Israel done with the system that wasn't supposed to be done with the system? Let's slow down right here for a minute and make sure we get this because I think we fly past this and sometimes in grace circles. Nothing wrong with the law. There was technically nothing wrong with the system. In fact, Paul would come along in Romans and go, the law is good and just and holy. Then what's the problem? Put law in front of people and their elementary principles of their heart will kick in. The elementary principles of this world will kick in. And what are the elementary principles of the world? Colossians chapter 2. Touch not, taste not, handle not. What's that mean? Well, it, mean, it means this, that if you put a system in front of people, their elementary principles will tell them, will, will say to them, do what you're told and you'll get blessed. Don't do what you you're told and you'll get cursed. So what did Israel do with, with the system? Romans 9, Paul says, Israel missed out on righteousness because they sought it through the works of the law. So what did they do with the law? They thought, well, if we could keep that, we would be righteous. What they had forgot was they were already righteous because they were Abraham's descendants. Israel's already right. They're Abraham's descendants. They're already righteous. But they see the law, and then they start to take their focus off of being Abraham's descendants and, and put it on the law, which puts it on yourself. So now you're doing all this stuff to try and be what you already are, and what happens is you start to replace what you already are with what you're doing. And you mentally start to go towards what you're doing. And that's, that's the problem with the law. This is why God come to get it out of the way. Jesus comes to go, we got to get rid of the law. we got to get rid of the whole system. i got to fulfill the law and we got to nail it to the cross because all it's going to do is be used like a weapon against you. The snake will always use that tree against you. If the tree is standing, the snake's going to use it against you because he's going to talk to you from the tree of performance. So John comes along and goes, you brood of vipers, you've been messing up God's people from a long time. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm the first axe blow against your system. This whole baby's coming down. And so that's John's basic message. Jesus comes along and says this. We're, we were in Matthew 3. Look at Matthew 12, nine chapters later. Either make the tree good and the fruit good, or else make the tree bad and the fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. Where did you see that before? Nine chapters earlier, John said it first. Jesus picks it up. 
says, okay, I agree with John. You are a bunch of snakes. How can you being evil speak good things out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? Make another comparison. Did you notice the two items in Jesus' conversation? What's the object of this first sentence? Tree. What's he called them? Brood of vipers. What'd John do? You brood of vipers. You're in a tree that needs cut down. I'm the first axe blow. Jesus comes along and goes, let me tell you something. If you're going to have a tree and it's supposed to be a good tree, it better have good fruit. If it's not going to have good fruit, don't call it a good tree. Just call it what it is. It's a bad tree because it has bad fruit. Quit lying to yourself, you bunch of snakes. That's the verse. Stop lying to the people, you bunch of snakes. Your tree isn't doing anyone any good. And that's what he means by either, because that's a strange phrase out of context. Either make the tree good, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree bad and the fruit bad. It's almost like if you took that out of context, you go, here's the way Jesus wants you to live. He either wants you to be a really good guy or a really bad guy. So either be really good or just mess the whole world up, you know, if you can, because that way no one's confused. It's not entirely wrong to say it that way. It's just out of context because he's talking about a bunch of snakes that's been using a tree to keep people under condemnation. And he goes, it'd be better off if people could tell the truth when they walked up. The problem is people can't tell the truth when they walk up because your temple's beautiful and your incense is holy and your lamb's blood's reminding them of sacrifices. And so on the surface, everything looks good but it's full of dead men's bones. Remember what he says to the Pharisees? Inside, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. I mean, who paints the outside of the tomb? It's full of dead men's bones. It doesn't do any good. And so what is Jesus saying? I think this is what's happening. Give me, yes, Jesus confronts the same quote unquote brood of vipers, because you know who that is, and you know where you saw that, at a tree, same thing John does. The accusation is that they are presenting the system as if it is a good thing with good fruit to offer, but it produces no life. It re what does it really not do? It really doesn't produce love. And this was the Pharisaical problem. I heard Malcolm Smith say this years ago and I never forgot it. He said, the Pharisees' problem is that loving people got in the way of pleasing God. And I always thought that was such a powerful statement. I've, tried, I've recycled that many times on my own, but basically it was this, to the Pharisee, and the Sadducee. Loving people was something you had to stop and take time out of your day to do because you had all this stuff you were doing for God. Listen, if loving people becomes a problem in what you do in living for the Lord, you need to get rid of all the other stuff you're doing in living for the Lord. I don't really have time to love people. I really have to fast. <laughs> I don't really have time to love people. I'm trying to make more money for God. I don't have time to love people because I have a prayer life. And I can't, let you, I can't let these heathens get involved, get in the way of my prayer life. I can't stop and help the, the helpless. I have to be studying. God would rather me study. You've missed God. That was Jesus' point. Either make the tree give good fruit or make it give bad fruit. It'd be better than confusing people. And so what Jesus is doing is confronting the same snake. It's a system that has... It looks like it's good, but there's no good fruit because it doesn't produce life. And this is the reason that Jesus eventually curses the fig tree, allowing his cross to serve as a new tree. Let me walk you through that story real quick. I know everybody's probably aware of it. I think we've even covered it here. But Jesus is going into the temple, and he sees a fig tree, and he walks over and he curses it. He's, he tries to eat off of it. There's no figs. There's no figs, and so Jesus says, you'll be cursed. He goes into the temple. He cleans the temple out. He comes back out of the temple and he's heading back down the same road and he sees the tree from yesterday. It's one of those amazing moments in Mark where it literally walks you through a day in the life of Jesus. Into the temple, curse the tree, clean the temple, come out of the temple, walk down the same road. Tree's on the other side of the road now because you're going the other way. And the disciples go, look, Jesus, there's the tree you cursed. It's all dried up. And Jesus says, of course it is. You say to a mountain, be removed, cast the sea, don't doubt in your heart, whatever you ask will be done. What's Jesus doing? We're going to a temple that's shiny and new and good, beautiful on the outside. It's supposed to bring people life. Watch what happens when we get there. It won't. 
and I'm going to clean it out. And on the way, I'm going to give you an object lesson. It's not going to show up till tomorrow. I'm going to look at a tree and I'm going to think I can get something off of it, but I can't. So what it's going to get is it's going to need to dry up from the root because all that tree is doing is lying to passersby, making them think there's something there. And I don't want that tree to exist because I don't want you to think there's life in something there's not. And to show you what I mean, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to clean that temple out because it's lifeless. And he tells Israel in Matthew 23, your house is going to be left to you desolate. You have it. I don't want your temple any longer. I'd rather live in temples made of hearts and souls rather than temples made of wood and stone. So when he comes out of the temple, there's that dried up tree. And Jesus goes, of course it's dried up. How can it not be dried up? It was an obstacle in life and it's been cast into a sea. It's been removed because it's not doing any good. I don't know if we realize the massive message he's sending to Israel, which is because Israel identifies herself as a fig tree in the Old Testament. You have been supposed to be giving people something to eat. And when they come to you, all you are is leaves. And so that shouldn't exist. And I am going to remove that system it is no longer viable. It is no longer going to be something that people can have. So remember John, my ax blows the first blow laid to the root of the tree. Remember Jesus, cursed is the fig tree, it dries up at the root. Then Calvary comes along and Jesus dies on a new tree. And when Jesus comes out of the grave, the revelation that the new church has, progressive revelation through the New Testament is, he did something special on that tree. I mean. It is a progressive revelation. Peter's first sermon in Acts, you killed him, you put him on a tree. By the time he writes 1 Peter, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. It's a whole different sermon. It's no longer, man, that stinks. You guys killed him on a tree. Now it's, he died for me on a tree and took all my sins away. What was he doing? He was giving me access to a, a new tree. What in the world does all that mean? How many trees are in the garden that God specifically names? That just one you can eat and one you can't? Tree of the knowledge of good and evil, tree of life. Adam and Eve never make it to the tree of life. They get stuck by a brood of vipers at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I know not a brood. They get stuck by a snake, but the imagery stands. And they live there because this tree causes you to put on an apron of figs and hide yourself in the bushes and consider yourself distant from God. This tree makes you think God's mad at you and is ticked off and you got to spend the rest of the Bible pleasing him. And this tree you're not even allowed to go eat off of because God says, nope, can't let you live in that state. I'm going to put some seraphim over it with a sword swinging around so that no one can have access to this. And then Jesus comes along and goes, axe is laid to the root of a tree. I'm going to take it down. I'm going to burn up the chaff and the fire. I've cursed that tree because it's supposed to be good, but it's not. And a sword is going to smite the shepherd at the cross. The sword that was guarding the way to the tree of life in the garden smites the shepherd on a new tree. And now you and I get to go eat from the tree of life anytime we want. It shows up in Revelation. Inside the new Jerusalem, the tree of life lines the rivers of living water. And the leaves heal the nations. Finally, God found a tree that works. The old system didn't work. It lied to you. It said it would work, but it didn't. It told you that if you lived right, you'd be blessed. And then you did your best to live right. And you watched people who didn't live right get as much as you get. The Old Testament, that surfaces a lot in the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs talks about that. Why do the wicked succeed? Proverbs is confused. The writer of Proverbs is confused. He goes, why is the wicked getting their stuff? Why are they, why are they They're not supposed to succeed. You're supposed to get bad if you do bad. And you're supposed to get good if you do good. Elementary principles of the world. It's because the system will lie to you. You can't be blessed because you did good. Seems simple enough. It's really, the, it's really the core of the gospel. When John says, repent, the kingdom's at hand, what he's saying is, get ready, change your mind. It's here. It's not down the road in Jerusalem, and you've been killing lambs forever, and that hadn't worked. The kingdom's at hand. And when he gets here, He's going to be, I'm not going to be able to unloose his shoes and his fans in his hand, he's going to thoroughly purge And that's Jesus. And so Jesus begins to preach and proclaim that message. And the cross serves as a new tree. Let's go back into the John 8 story. Let's pick it up from the next verse. John 8, 34. Jesus answers them. Remember what they said? What? <laughs> We're Abraham's seed. What do you mean? Free. We've never been in bondage to anybody. So Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and the slave does not abide in the house forever 
but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, I've wrestled with this passage for so long in my life trying to figure out what Jesus means about the slavery to sin and the sonship and who gets to live in the house. The metaphor crosses itself at one point and almost looks, the, the longer you stare at it, the more you end up confused. And so what I did is take the long step back and watch how the Apostle Paul, remember where we started? Where Paul tells you that if you're Abraham's, if you're faith in Christ, you're an heir and you're Abraham's seed. Remember how we saw John connect snakes and trees and Jesus connect snakes and trees? These images shouldn't be lost on us as Bible students because what happens is the teachers of the Bible start to mix images together to, make, to get you to think in a certain way. And so Jesus, when confronted with Abraham's descendants, brings up slaves and sons which is an interesting thing to do. So in the midst, next screen, in the midst of an argument about Abraham's descendants, Jesus mentions sons and slaves. Paul takes his cue from this style. I originally had this sentence saying, Paul takes his cue from this argument. The reality is, is that Paul probably didn't know about this argument in John 8, but he does know about this style of argument, which is correlate two things together so that people think properly. So when the, when the Jewish leaders brought up Abraham's descendants, why does Jesus automatically bring up sons and slaves? Why start talking about sons and slaves? Well, maybe that's the way you're supposed to present the descendant argument because watch how Paul does it. Here was, our, here was that 29th verse from tonight. This was that one we, we added context to. Look at Galatians 3.29. If you're Christ's, then you're Abraham's seed, Heirs according to promise. Now that's the end of Galatians 3, but that's not the end of the thought. That's just where we, I, I was going to say foolishly broke it into chapters. I don't know if it was foolish, but it is what it is, right? This could have easily been Galatians 3.30. Now, because it's the next verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, doesn't differ at all from a slave. Time out real quick. You got... Abraham's seed getting an inheritance and Paul goes to slaves and sons immediately. It's like a natural knee-jerk reaction. Oh, you want to talk about Abraham's descendants? Let's talk slaves and sons. Jesus does the same thing in John 8. You guys bring up Abraham's descendants? Let me talk to you about slaves and sons. So it tells me that there's something in the core of this argument. So I say that an heir, as long as he's a child, isn't any different at all from a slave, though that child is master of all, but he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. What that scripture means, and I don't want to get in the weeds here in Galatians 4, but this will help. Paul has just told you, if you have faith in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. You guys, Jews, you've been bragging about being Abraham's seed, but as long as you're under a tutor, you're really not master of anything. You might be the lord of the castle, but you don't get to call any shots because the tutor's over you. Now, only when your father releases you from the tutor do you get to come into the fullness of your inheritance. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. What are the basic elementary principles of the world? Touch not, taste not, hand not. Okay. Basic elementary principles of the world, touch not, taste not, hand not. In other words, performance. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. If you, that's the world. You don't have to be a Christian to know do good, get good, do bad, get bad. Just ask a five-year-old. How do we know that? Elementary principles of the world. And so Paul, Paul says, doesn't matter who your daddy is, as long as a tutor's holding your hand, you don't get to rule nothing because the tutor rules you, right? And so you were, when you were a child, you were in bondage under the elements of the world for, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, Important that Jesus be born of a woman so he's human, born under the law so he's Jewish. Because he's got to take care of those two issues. To redeem those who were under the law that they might receive the adoption as sons. Why do they need to be adopted as sons? Because what are you? As long as you're under a tutor, you're no better than a slave. That's how he opened the chapter. As long as you're under a tutor, you're no better than a slave. In other words, as long as you needed the law over you, you were no better than a slave. Why would you brag about being a son? Who cares that you're a son? You're a little son who's holding the hand of his teacher. You don't have any power. And so the law worked as a tutor. That's the end of chapter 3. A tutor, a schoolmaster, until Christ. Then you could be adopted. 
And five, six, because your sons, now God sent the Holy Spirit of His Son into your hearts, and the Holy Spirit cries, Abba, Father. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches you to call Dad Father, because the Holy Spirit only knows God as Father. He doesn't know it, Master, Servant. Seems like the Holy Spirit's not some lackey that runs around, God goes, you go do this, and, goes, yes. and he just runs off and does what he's No, it, it's not a servant-master relationship. And so he cries out, Abba, Father, therefore you're no longer a slave, you're a son, and if you're a son, then what are you? You're an heir of God through Christ. So when Paul talks about Abraham's descendants, he can't help himself. He talks about slaves and sons, which tell, Paul's message is this. Just because you're Abraham's descendants doesn't mean you're not living like a slave. Just because you're Abraham's descendants doesn't mean you're an heir of God. That's Paul's argument. What, what's his argument based on? Little kids have tutors, teachers, live in teachers. They didn't, we have a tutor we go to after school. That's not what Paul means. Tutors in their day were people that lived in the house and raised the kids. Closer in our vernacular would be a nanny. The nanny raises the kids. Dad forgets they're in the house. The nanny takes care of them. Paul goes, you want to brag about being Abraham's kids? You guys were under the law so long, you didn't call nothing. You never called God Daddy. You never called him Abba Father. You were holding the hand of the law so long, you thought it made you righteous. He goes, that's not what it means to be a son. So the moment you start bragging about being Abraham's descendants, you're going to have to ask yourself this question. Am I living like a slave or am I living like a son? Because that's what Jesus does in John 8. The moment the Pharisees go, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. Don't tell us where you got to be free. And Jesus goes, let me tell you a little story about slaves and sons. Because you want to talk about Abraham's kids, you need to figure out which one you are. You need to figure out if you're a slave or you need to figure out if you're a son. And so go back to John 8. Here's 37. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father and you do what you've seen with your father. Before I read any further, I want to make sure that we really catch this verse, the fullness of which we won't really dig into until next week. So if I get to the end of this little description, you know, I, don't, I don't see that. Next week's lesson really pulls the fullness of what Jesus meant by your father. Because he, this little F father versus big F father, that's two entirely different worlds. And it doesn't even have anything to do with your earthly dad versus your heavenly dad, although they probably thought that it did. Jesus is speaking much, much deeper. I know you are Abraham's descendants means I know you literally can trace your blood to Abraham. You guys know who your great, 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 great grandfather is. True, I'll give you that. But you guys are seeking to kill me because my, my word doesn't have any place in you. What I'm saying to you doesn't register in your heart. You, all you're doing is bragging about who your heritage is, but you, don't, you haven't had any kind of heart encounter. I'm only going to say what I've seen with my father. You guys are going to do what you've seen with your father. This prompts this answer. Abraham's our father. And Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, then you'd do the works of Abraham. Now, did you catch what looks like an inconsistency? Top of the screen, Jesus says, go back. I know you're Abraham's descendants. That's verse 37. Look at 39. If you were Abraham's children, then you'd do the works of Abraham. He opens the conversation with, I know you're Abraham's descendants. The bottom, he says, but if you were his kids, then you'd do the works he told you to do. What's the difference? Aren't the descendants the kids? Remember, remember, the snap reaction for the Jewish teacher, both Jesus and Paul, was when you bring up inheritance and descendants, you got to start talking about slaves and sons because they immediately see the difference. That just because you're a descendant doesn't mean you're calling the shots because it's very possible that you're, not, that you're not in the position of walking in the fullness of an inheritance. So I, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham, 40, but now you seek to kill me. A man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham didn't do this. That's, I, I think that's almost a comical statement at the end. I mean, Abraham didn't, 
Abraham didn't do this. You guys, children of Abraham, why are you so mad at me? Abraham didn't get mad at God. And so it's really Jesus' way of saying, I, I and the Father are speaking to you truth. So I want to put those two up against one another one, one more time. 37 and 40. Verse 37, I know you are Abraham's descendants. And then I think it's actually verse 39, but I said verse 40. If you were Abraham's children. There's a difference in descending from Abraham, being children of Abraham. The church often confuses the promises of God to Israel as being upon Abraham's descendants. But the New Testament sees them as being upon Abraham's children. I want you to really hone in on that phrase for a moment. Much of the modern church, particularly the American church, confuses Abraham's descendants and Abraham's children because we make statements like, God's going to bless Israel. He has to. He made a promise to Abraham. What was the promise that he made to Abraham? That he'd bless his children. And then the American church doesn't make a distinction between the descendants of Israel, of Abraham, and the children of Abraham. And because of that, I think there is a misguided theological practice in the modern church of thinking that you should bless national Israel and everyone who calls themselves a Jew because God has made a promise to national Israel and everyone who calls themselves a Jew that God can't break. Regardless of his covenant with Jesus and the church, he can't put the covenant on the back burner that he made with Abraham's children. You're right. He can't put the covenant on the back burner that he made with Abraham's children. You're wrong in thinking that everyone that's in Israel or calls themselves a Jew is Abraham's children. What we're calling Abraham's children, for the most part, are Abraham's descendants. People who can trace their genealogy to a religion. But the New Testament does not describe Abraham's children as being the same thing as Abraham's descendants. And the importance in that difference is massive. Go to Galatians 3. Look at 15 and 16. Paul says this, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it's only a man's covenant. Yet if it's confirmed, no one can annul or add to it. That's his way of saying if God makes a covenant with Abraham, God's got to keep that covenant with Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, to your seed, who is Christ. Pay attention to this text. Paul says this. I always get, I always get a little bit giddy on this passage because I, I can't, A, I can't believe we haven't really caught this in the church because this is in all of our Bibles. And B, it fascinates me that this is the single most important revelation of your inheritance. This is it. God makes a promise to Abraham and his seed, not to Abraham and to his seeds. Think of it this way. God makes a promise to Abraham and his child not to Abraham and his descendants. How do you know that's what he means? Because watch what happens in this text. If it were seeds, it'd be a bunch of you. But it's one, and the seed is who? I know, I'm being, I know you don't need me to be pointing at words, but the reality is I can't figure out why we've missed this for so long, so I went resorted back to the ABCs of pointing at words because I think we're just flying through text sometimes, you know, trying to figure out, I don't, I don't know what we're trying, who knows who cares, but the reality is, is we're missing this amazing thing that Paul said, which is this, God made a promise to Abraham and you've lived your entire life, Israel, thinking it was yours and you've been dead wrong. Because it's not really yours. It's Jesus's. Who's the seed? <laughs> if it were yours, it would say seeds. But it's not yours. And it was never yours. It was always to a seed. It was to his family, not to his descendants. And there's a huge difference in his descendants 
and his family. Now, Paul makes the, Jesus flirts with the distinction because he's in the midst of national Israel and their temple's still standing. And his flirt is quite a flirt. Here's his flirt. I know you're his descendants, but if you were his kids, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. And they gasped. What do you mean? There's no difference in his descendants and his kids. And Jesus leaves it alone. He lets it hang there and it goes to the cross with him. And then Paul picks it up. And Paul takes it to the next level. Because he can. Because he's on the other side of the resurrection. And that temple's about to come down. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. It's literally, I said this today on the podcast. I said the New Testament is screaming timber. That's, the, that's what the writers of the New Testament are screaming. Timber, it's coming down. Get out of the way. Jesus said, flee to the hills of Judea. When you see it come and pray, your flight be not in winter and they be not pregnant. Uh, when you see where wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and diverse places and various things, it's coming down. This whole thing, your house has left you desolate. It's, it's falling. Uh, Hebrews 8, 13, that which is old, ready to vanish away is about to disappear. It's coming down the entire time. The whole system is falling like a big Jenga statue, tower. In the New Testament, the New Testament writers are going, we upon whom the ends of the world have come, we in these last days, uh, uh, we in this present crisis, uh, you know, that which is short at hand, that which is soon to come to pass. And it's all John swinging his axe at the root and Jesus knocking a tree over and going, it was never to you, it was always to me. That's why when a woman come to me at a meeting recently and said, don't you believe that uh, God has promises he has to fulfill in Israel? And I go, no, I believe God fulfilled his promises in Jesus. He found his Israel. He found his ultimate contender. He found his last man. He's not still looking for somebody he can bless. He's found his somebody to bless. It's why Paul's great revelation of 2 Corinthians 1, all of the promises of God are in Christ and they are yes and they are amen to God's glory. What did he mean? God has nothing left. He owes you. He gave it all to Jesus. And he said, if you want it, you're going to come in through him. And if you come in through him, you get all of it. You don't get a little bit of it. You get all of it. Why? Because he's the seed. And so you could be a descendant, not be a child. It'd be tragic to be able to trace back what you thought belonged to you and find out there was only one way to get it. You thought you got it because you got circumcised. You thought you got it because your grandpa got it. You thought you got it because you could quote your genealogy. And Jesus goes, forget it. None of that matters. What matters is that you are a part of who he says you are. So that I think the church confusing this is a tragedy. I speak in the manner of men. If it's only a man's covenant, even if it's confirmed, even if it was just a man's covenant, you can't mess with it. What would you do if it was a big covenant like Abraham and his seed? And that seed who is Christ. Now, go back to where we started. This is going to make more sense than it did an hour, 45 minutes ago. You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as were baptized into Christ, put on Christ. In Him, guys, there's not a Jew, there's not a Greek, there's not a slave, there's not a free, there's not a man, there's not a woman. You're all one in Christ. And if you're Christ's, and this was, this is the junk right here. This last sentence, this gets your head chopped off in a prison yard. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's, not seeds. He just changed the game, man. It was one moment he changed the game. What did he say? The seeds don't get it, the seed gets it. Who's the seed? Christ. And if you belong to Christ, what are you? You're the seed. You're the child. You're the kid. You're the heir according to action, works, performance. You get what God said to Abraham. Abraham was a Gentile, called out of the land of his father, given a challenge of faith. He answered the challenge. He went down the road. He faces a slew of dragons. His ultimate reward is your seed gets everything in the treasure chest. And Abraham lays his head on his deathbed and dies a happy man because his seed wins. And his seeds are blessed along the way. And then when God shows up in the flesh, God fulfills the promise he made to Abraham to bless the seed. 
It wasn't new. What does God say to the snake in the garden? He says to Adam, did you eat from the tree? And Adam goes, she made me. And he says to the woman, did you eat from the tree? And she goes, that made me. And he looks to the snake. And he doesn't ask the snake any questions. I mean, who's the snake going to blame? The worm? So he says to the snake, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Not your seeds. Not her seeds. You're going to bruise his heel. And he's going to bruise your head. And from the very beginning of the Bible, the singular seed was always the victor that beats up the brood of vipers. Always. Story never changes. And the best the viper can do is nip at the heels of the seed. So when God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless your seed, God wasn't being tricky. God was using the same word he used in the garden. I'm blessing one man. I'm blessing the one man in the earth I've been waiting on. He's coming from your loins. He's way generations from you, but one seed. And then when Jesus comes, the ultimate, he's, he's everything. He's everything that the Old Testament aspired to be. He's everything that humanity longed to be. He's not just the ultimate man in some masculine sense. He's the ultimate human. He's everything God envisioned when he put a man in the garden and said, very good. And then he makes the ultimate sacrifice. He does what, 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 what's the hardest thing to do is lay your life down for someone who's not as good as you. You know, I mean, it's one thing to lay your life down for somebody that's your kid and somebody that's your blood, but to lay your life down for somebody that ain't as good as you, somebody that hates you, somebody that despises you, somebody that doesn't even believe you exist. That's the ultimate Adam, and that's, that's Jesus. And God smiles. This is my beloved son. Look at him. All that I have is in his seed. And God, Paul says this. This is why, honestly, this is a side note, but this is why how you feel about the Apostle Paul will be how equal your revelation is to how much you're a child of God. I really believe that. If you think Paul was a little bit out there, then you're probably not going to walk in a revelation of grace. Because Paul says stuff like this to the Romans. He says, God sheds forth his righteousness in that he is both just and justifier of those who believe in Christ. God shows you he's good by justifying people who believe in his son. Because when you believe in his son, God doesn't just look at you through Jesus' glasses. God looks at you as if you're Jesus. I'll say it again, because it's, it's really big, right? That's why Paul said the mystery has been shut up from the ages, but it hath now been revealed to us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It wasn't Paul just going, hey, guess what? Jesus is close. Jesus is coming back. No, it was Paul going, he's there. He's in you. He's, he's, there's no separation for the Father. He blesses his seed. He blesses you. Those of you who believe on him, he blesses you as his seed. You get to re receive the fullness of that. This is why I, I can't tell you the groups that I've taken to Galatians 3.29 over the years to say, let's start and end here. What would this look like if you had a revelation that you were one of Abraham's seed? Well, it might make you believe it belonged to you. So I challenged it with this thought. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're Abraham's descendants, but you're not Abraham's children. What did he mean? Tracing your lineage through Abraham is no good anymore. That system's coming down. The ax has been laid to the root of that tree. If you were his kids, you'd accept me. Paul would say this in Romans 2. He is a Jew, not he of whom has been circumcised on the outside, but he who has been circumcised on the heart. What did Paul mean by that? It was an early way of saying God's people are not made up by what they can trace in their lineage. God's people are made up by who they believe in their heart. 
Because circumcision on the outside just identifies you with Abraham. Circumcision on the inside identifies you with Jesus. So one of them's a descendant, the other one's a child. My challenge to the church is stop acting as if God owes someone else something that he hasn't already given completely in Jesus. It's an insult to the finished work. He doesn't owe anyone on the earth anything he hasn't already paid for through Jesus. There's no alternate way to the Father but through the Son. And yes, honor people, love them, don't mistreat them. But to honor Abraham's descendants because we are under the misguided idea that they have a covenant God still owes them for is to misunderstand that God never owed the descendants anything. He owed the seed everything and the seed has already come and his name is Jesus. It's heady stuff, ain't it? It's pretty big. It's pretty big. Here's where we'll be next week, John 8, 41. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Ooh. <laughs> then, there, then there are fighting words. We're not, a, we're, we're not products of fornication like somebody, they say as they talk to Jesus. We heard stories about your mom and your, your, mom and your dad. And th this is their punchback for his, you might, not, you might be Abraham's descendants, but you ain't Abraham's kids. And they go, well, we'll tell you what it means to be a kid. We'll tell you what it means to know our dad and our mom. And you'd think we're going to have a knockdown, drag out fist fight after this, but you know better. Jesus has some things to say. Next week is one of my favorite moments in John 8. As much as I love the woman caught in the act of adultery, I love the moment where Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. And his works will you do because Jesus was not calling them Satan worshipers. Jesus reaches way back into the Torah to grab hold of the first murderer and then compare the role of a first murderer who kills a shepherd in a garden with the role of a new set of murderers who's going to kill another shepherd in another garden. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, go read the story of Cain and Abel. That's next week. You had a father and he did something. I've enjoyed this. I know we've plowed into some deep ground, and I know that it's a, a risky proposition to get people to admit the descendants and children are, are, are two different things, but I hope you will take that journey. Let's pray. Let's pray close and we'll, and we'll see what, where the Lord leads that. Father, thank you for tonight and this word, and I thank you that this revelation settled in my heart a long time ago. It, it gave me an ease of mind of knowing that I don't owe you anything but my faith. And that if I would place my faith in you, I am looked at as you look at Jesus. I become Abraham's son. Which means I get what you promised to the seed. I don't believe you're holding out for anyone else. I believe you've poured it all through your son. And for those who know your son, they know your heart. And knowing your heart, that's the exploration we get to do for the rest of our lives is figure out what that looks like. Thank you for this privilege. Help this word as it goes into people's hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen.